Tonight we're continuing in the first chapter of, of Ephesians. This is like a holy place. And we want you to be able to comprehend the depth of what's being said here. <coughs> Paul is uh, rehearsing or recapping the cause for salvation. Because in the religious hodgepodge that we are unfortunate to inhabit, the cause of salvation is often overlooked. And salvation is actually taken for granted. And a whole lot of thought is not put into maintaining it. You'll, yeah. I mean, I hate to say these things, understand what they do have to be said. You'll be hard pressed to find someone that's concerned about staying saved. Yeah. And their leaders aren't too interested in it either. Because they're not feeding the people. They're trying to help the people live good lives on earth. Now, no one's opposed to this, understand. It's just that this is not to be the subject of preaching and teaching. If you can't work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, then that's what you've got to concentrate on to even address these other things that are happening in the world. Jesus is <coughs> concentrating on, uh, Paul is concentrating on what's been accomplished by Jesus and God, God and Jesus in that order. Yeah. Only when that's been firmly established in your mind, you can see it. I mean, you can see it, what God's done through Christ. Not just that you know it intellectually. You can just be a inch above an idiot and understand what the Bible says about that. But I mean, you've got to see it. You've got to comprehend it. You've got to discern it. It's not enough to be able to quote it. You've got to see it. And perceive it. What God has done in Christ. Because see, God doesn't do anything halfway or partial or inadequately. His work is perfect. And it so happens you're his work. Amen. Now the, the knowledge of this becomes an impetus. It, it's like a dynamo that, that drives you. Once you see what God has done in Christ, doubt is assaulted. Yeah. It's thrust out of the picture. Now all of a sudden... You see life differently. Now the goal kind of clears up. And you find out there's a way been open to make it all the way there. That's why he's laboring on these things as he is. Now human response to the gospel is an essential, but it's not foundational. I mean, I worked a long time on that sentence. I find that you had you want to get hold of it. It's essential, but it's not foundational. Foundations belong to God. Responses belong to you. And blessed is the person that can see it. They can see it. It's not the human response is not the subject of preaching. Preaching, that type of thing is always secondary in proclamation. It's made to novices. It's made when there's problems where people are not living by faith. But foundational, the foundations, that's the subject of preaching. Uh, you know when you have a subject, you've got outlines. You've got a lot of sub points and minor points and but if you make these minor points your major headings, <laughs> which is what's being done in our day? The minor points have been made the headings. And what's the result? 
a weak, emaciated, disinterested church. That like getting them together is a major task, particularly if it's more than once a week. See, everybody knows this is the truth, but it's not fashionable to talk about it. But this is the truth, and everybody knows it. I can tell you that if the average preacher had to prepare more than one sermon a week, he'd probably quit. If you don't believe that, you haven't been around very long. And we're talking at that point of 20 and 30 minute messages. We're not talking about anything of any substance. The gospel of Christ, in the gospel of Christ, deity is the emphasis. Uh, now this, we'll go over there, we'll keep going over this because that's what this text this keeps, keeps going over this. Deity is the emphasis. God and Christ are the emphasis. When it comes to what's being done, what God and Christ have done are the emphasis. Those are the main things. Wherever, now this, I'm going to attack a sacred cow here, but this is the truth. Wherever evangelism and making disciples are considered primary activities, opportunists come in. This is like an open door to career makers. And it's not the emphasis of Scripture. And anyone who says it is simply does not know what they're talking about. And I go on record here. And now I challenge somebody in the whole world at any time to confirm that evangelism and making disciples are the thrust of Scripture. In fact, I challenge them to come up with ten texts that even talk about it. And I'll show you a thousand that talk about God and Christ. Amen. A thousand to one. You, I say this because Paul didn't mention anything about like that in this. Text. We're talking about talking to the church now, what the message you deliver to the church. That's what we're talking about. If you want God's people to grow and to be empowered and to be ready for heaven, and nobody's going to get in that's not ready for it. Let's not be, let's not kid any other, anybody about this. If a person's not ready to live with Christ, he's not going to live with them. Amen. If they're not prepared to be married to the Lamb, they aren't going to be married to him. And that's what Paul is doing. He says, he, is, he went on record of what his aim is, to present you perfect in Christ. That was his aim. That should be your, anyone you have influence over in Christ. Your objective is not to make a living by them. Your objective is to get them to the throne of God, perfect and without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And if that isn't accomplished, God's going to destroy you. It says there in 1 Corinthians 3, Whosoever shall defile the temple of God, him will God destroy. He means it. Talking about what kind of people are headed in there. So when you know this, you know why Paul's so fervent in what he's saying here. He, he knows that's the case. He knows that if the, bird, if the man's work and you are the work, if the man's work abides, gold, silver, precious stones, he'll have a reward. If it doesn't, he not only shall have wasted his time, he will suffer loss. And he himself has got to pass through the fire of judgment. So with this in mind, <coughs> Paul continues. As we said before, from verse 3 through 12 is one sentence. <laughs> 
One interrelated sentence. <laughs> now, back before TV, we used to have long sentences, but now, now the people advocate short sentences. I'm an anti-short sentence person. I'm against it because it makes pea brains. Why do you have short sentences? Because people can't have an extended thought. <coughs> well, they, in the scripture, you had to learn to think an extended thought with all kind of interrelationships and tributaries of thought. You had to be able to do it. He'll start a sentence, he'll say, and, therefore, unto, for, and he'll elaborate. See, that's what he's doing in this text here. All these things are related. You take one of these things out, and the entire structure of verses 3 through 12 falls to the ground. They all stand together. We're going to look at verse 13 and 14. In whom also ye also trusted. Uh, notice he doesn't say you ought to have trusted. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Now, when you read that, you sense that Paul assumes you understand what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah. Huh? Yeah. But the truth of the matter is, brother, dear brethren, that the average Christian doesn't have the faintest idea what he's talking about. If you don't believe that, quote this passage to somebody and then step back and say, what do you think of that? Do it! See, God's people ought to put these things to the test. We're not, when we talk about spiritual Babylon and people being deluded, we're just not whistling. Put it to the test. See if people know what you're talking about when you use language like this. First place, you'll, the group I come from, you didn't talk about when you first trusted this. That you didn't even use that kind of language. Did you, Brother Tony, you've been there. Did they use that kind of language? He didn't use this kind of language at all. He does. In whom ye also trusted. <laughs> well, who's the whom? <laughs> In whom? Who is the whom? Well, the last, the first, last clause of the preceding verse is, who first trusted in Christ. So Christ is the whom we're talking about. Amen. Now, Paul continues developing this thought of trusting in Christ. I mean, do you trust in Christ? I mean, do you, do, you, do you depend on him being what God said he is? See? Do you, are you leaning on him with no question at all that if Jesus collapses, you will too? In whom ye trusted. I mean, the clause is that the whole process of salvation depends on Christ. Amen. From beginning to end. It all depends on Christ. If Christ doesn't hold up to be exactly what God said he is, then it doesn't make any difference what you do. You will fall. It, it doesn't make any difference how hard you try. You will fall. In whom ye trusted. Everything prior to trusting in Christ, conviction, resolution, determination, whatever it was, was just a, a prelude to the experience of salvation. If someone turning their attention toward Christ, that's just a prelude. That's not the tune, that's the prelude. The experience itself is salvation. And it's accomplished by you trusting. Now, unless a person gets to the point where Christ is trusted, not your family, not your education, not your church, <laughs> not your job, 
We're not talking about like a part of your life. Trust. Leaning particularly upon him. Dependency on self and self-strength has got to, at some point, it's got to terminate. Amen. Now, the world won't teach you this. The world will teach you to rely on self. If you're a talented person, in whatever field it is, the world will teach you to depend on your ability. It'll, dry, it'll drum that into you. It'll tell you that the discipline is of your ability. That's the secret. Back behind their voice, Christ is saying, I gave you the ability. You either trust in me or your ability will not advantage you. Amen. Yes. Yeah, this, is the, this is just a bedrock Amen. truth. Now, Luke was a doctor, a physician, a beloved physician, but he trusted in Christ. You're making a living, you got to trust in Christ. You can't say to yourself, I wonder if the company's going to hold up or not. This isn't, this isn't how a believer should think. I wonder if the economy is going to sustain me or not. Someone will say, oh boy, things are going pretty bad. A bunch of us are going to get laid off. This isn't how you can think. Yeah. Trust in Christ applies there too. Mm -hmm. See, because you're working out your salvation in that environment. Right. So you've got to trust Christ mm -hmm. in that environment. There are, if there are practical measures to take, we understand that you take it. We understand that. But your trust is in Christ. Yes. I'm example of this. Wherever he went, wherever he did, he just trusted that the Lord was going to take care of what he needed for the the job he had him to do. That's right. Yeah. Amen. The person who refuses to put trust in Christ and puts confidence in anyone else or anything else will not be received by God. A, we have to say this. I know it's a, in a sense it's a hard saying, but in a sense it's like a wake-up call. The believer has to get to the point where he says, to whom shall we go? Yes. Where are we going to go? To get what we need, where are we going to go? Thou hast the words of life. See, when the, people, when the disciples walked with Jesus, they didn't starve. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a shortage of food. Now, when you walk with Jesus, you have to, necessary things are granted when you walk with him. <laughs> Professing Christians are finding it too easy to trust in other things. It's very much of a concern to, to thinking people. Like it's too easy. In today's culture, it's too easy to backslide. It's too easy to fall away. It's too easy to forget God. It's too easy. It should be hard. The church should produce such an environment that it's hard to fall away. Amen. It's hard. In whom you also trusted. So here's where the doctrine is personalized until you trust the doctrine is just a body of teaching but when you begin to trust now now it's personalized this is where salvation commences the experience of salvation commences with trust whom ye trusted is one thing to to hear what's to be done, but to do what's to be done. Now, that's, that's something else. The original nucleus of disciples in Ephesus had to learn to trust Christ while they were in a contentious, argumentative synagogue. Paul came there, disputed in the synagogue for three months, 
Disputed didn't mean necessarily debate, but they to and fro. This is the way it is. We don't like it that way. You know, back and forth. Three months. That's the environment now they had to learn to trust in. They had to make a selection between who the, what the synagogue rulers were saying and what Paul was saying. And it come to the point, Paul said, that's it. We're out of here. No more. Three months. Now. Listen, some people have been living in environments like this for years. Yes. For decades. Three months. That was it. Then he took the disciples out of there. And they went to the school of Tyrannus, which is a more neutral position. Place. And there he taught them. What did he do? That's when they trusted he discerned they were trusted, and this was becoming to be an antitrust environment. She so took them out, went to another place. You trusted, and ye also trusted. Other versions read, you also were included in Christ. Living Bible says, all of you, all the you others too, that is, we trust it, you trust it too. The idea here is that the Ephesians came in the same way everybody else did, by trusting. Yeah. <laughs> yes? It's a matter of trust. It's difficult for people whose focus is not proper that we're talking about salvation. We're talking about eternal life. Mm -hmm. uh, our immortal souls that that um, the things occurrences of this life are not the main focus whenever this earth becomes the main thing then you go wherever it is you can get what you desire if what you desire is a full belly and opulent living and whatever it is that you're you're thinking of if this is not what what you're going to get whenever you think you're serving God, then you'll go to someone that will give it to you. This is what you're after. When a, a person like that cannot say whether we live or whether we die, we're the Lord. We're the Lord. That's right. A person like that cannot say, I learned to be, to what, whatever state I'm in, to be content. They can't say that. They're driven by a covetous spirit, and their eyes are full of the earth. And this matter of trust says that that what we're doing is is we're seeking for honor and glory and immortality, and only Christ can minister that to us. Amen. There's absolutely no other way to get that. And if we do it through poverty, if this is the Lord's pleasure. This trust says, I can do this because in, by Christ, I can, I can do all things. If, if it's through riches, that takes a special grace too, so that you don't, as Solomon said, that they, not to uh, curse God or to blaspheme by, by being covetous. Mm -hmm. So the state of our, our, <coughs> our present condition while God is not like unconcerned with us and we don't just throw everything to the wind and are careless and bad stewards and everything, we don't do things to intentionally harm ourselves, this trust says the will of God be done. Amen. Mm -hmm. It makes no difference whether you're in prison or whether you're in a Manhattan business office. Trusting God is essential. Amen. You may be in the desert, by your, impoverished, you got to trust God. You may be sitting in the midst of plenty, you've got to trust God. Amen. It's possible to have such small objectives that you find no yeah. need for Christ. That's right. That's, that's exactly. the thing that's so Amen. devastating about another gospel. Yeah. That's right. Is that the objectives are lowered. Mm -hmm. You know, just having a good family or just being a good person in the community. Or even resolution to fail, you know, we just fail all the time as God, we, but you're not compelled to hire things like be ye perfect, set your affection on things above, perfect holiness in the fear of God, mm -hmm. make no provision, 
See, all those are things that you have to have Christ for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what the gospel does is it stirs your heart so much that you long for this so yeah. much that see, it's a context in which in which Christ becomes Amen. absolutely critical. Amen. You know, there was a time Paul told the Corinthians, he said, when I had need, I didn't tell you. But he told them. I didn't even tell you. Why not? Because they were in an unsuitable right. spiritual condition. So he said the brethren in Macedonia, they they helped me. I didn't tell you. In other words, he wouldn't re he wouldn't receive support from people who were undevoted to God. Yeah. He wouldn't. That he give to whoever had need. When you trusted Christ, this is the foundation of, of, of life. Trust, when you first trusted, you trusted in Christ. Now if I were to ask you, when did you trust who first, when did you first trust in Christ? It would be hard to set a date. <laughs> Set a date on that, and that, that's not what he's talking about, date setting here. You've got to realize that you have, and when you there's something about trust. When you trust, it, it is, you don't think of it in terms of time mm -hmm. and, and dates. Mm -hmm. it's, it's now, it's in the now. Yeah, that's right. Amen. And if you're trusted in Christ now, there was you first did it sometime. And what he's saying is that's when this whole process of salvation began. Is when you trusted. Yeah, really good. If you look back at it, there's been times when you've made like a super abundant progress. Yeah. And then you can trace it back that you you were relying, your faith was growing. Yeah. And you were obviously God enabled you yeah. to do this behind the scenes, but you were a part of the yeah. pro process. You you gave more than you gave before. Amen. Yeah, the point he's established is not he's not trying to establish when did this first happen. Mm -hmm. He's explaining that when you, when you began to make this progress and participate in salvation, it all started with you trusting. Amen. Amen. And when you when you trusted, when did you trust? After that you heard. <laughs> That's when you trusted. Trusting depends on a word, on hearing a word. In this case, it's going to be the gospel. He's going to tell, point out it is the gospel. You some say, some versions read, when you listen to the message. Message is going out there. See, listening is when you reach up and you pull it in. Some people, they hear the message, but it's like, going over their head all the time. They're never, it doesn't profit. They, they, they didn't really hear it. Heard the sound, the sound went out, but they didn't take it to take it in. So when you hear these things, you've got to reach up and take it in. Heard the message, or given a message. When you first listened to the proclamation, all of a sudden, maybe, it, maybe you had actually heard the words before, but now it was different now, and now you're paying attention. That's... That's what started God working in you. That's when it started, right then. When you paid attention. Yes. Some people sat in church for years and years and years, never paid any attention. So they've not been changed. God is not working in them because this is what kicks off the work. Trusting, depending, relying, leaning upon the, on the Lord that's declared in the message. That Lord. Amen. So after that you heard... The word of truth. The word of reality. The proclamation of things that really are. Not the proclamation of things that ought to be, but things that really are. You heard that proclamation, the message of truth, or the true message, some versions read, the proclamation of truth, verbal announcement of it. What is heard is a message of reality. God refers to it as a record God has given of his son. The gospel is really what God has said about Christ. That, that's what, the, what it is. And there comes a time when this, you're listening to this, see? 
Until that time, the person of the world, they, a message about Christ is not a relevant message to them. It, it's not something they need. I've got, I've got things I really need. I'm not, I don't need to have this. Oh, this is what you need. You need to know what God has said about Christ because your condition is not going to be altered until you hear this message and embrace it with the whole heart. Because this is the power, God's power, unto salvation. There isn't going to be any salvation where the gospel is not preached. Now, there may be decisions. There may be baptisms. There may be church additions. But if the gospel is not what's been preached, there have not been any conversions. Because the gospel is what effects salvation. That's God's power to affect it. And it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not the gospel of the church, not the gospel of a movement, not the gospel of a human state of health and wealth. It's the message of Jesus Christ. Not just that he went about doing good and healing all the oppressed of the devil, but that he died, was buried, rose again, went back to heaven, is seated on the right hand of God, and never lives to make intercession for the saints. And if that thing isn't told, mm -hmm. salvation is out of reach. Yes, amen. Yeah, that's where the power is at, too. That's, that's right. People listen to any other kind of message. That's right. It and seems simple. No power in that. Yeah. It seems simple, but see, it's not. It's not so simple as it seems, or it would be done. Be be done. Now listen how he refers to the gospel, <coughs> the gospel of your salvation, the good news of your salvation. One version reads the good news offering you deliverance. That's, that's a bad translation. The good news that he has saved you. That's, that's, pretty, that's pretty accurate there. The good news about how to be saved. That's a living Bible. <laughs> that's terrible. The good news of your salvation. That's what you heard. You heard this. He divulged, this message finds out who the people really are. Whether they were chosen in Christ. Remember he told, he told us how this thing all gets started. We were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. We were predestinated unto adoption. We were predestinated to obtain an inheritance. How are you going to find out? who was chosen, who was predestinated to be adopted, who was predestinated to obtain an inheritance. Now that is not an interpretation. That's just write out what the word says. Amen. How are you going to find out who that is? You're going to preach the gospel. And whoever listens to this gospel, they're the ones. Yes? You're going to stand on the corner. You're going to proclaim free food and free water. <laughs> and for those who are hungry and thirsty, mm -hmm. they'll they'll hear it. Come to the and waters. everybody else will just it'll just go over. That's right. See, this is this is how he can see it's the gospel of your salvation. What he's saying is the fact that you responded to this gospel confirms that God chose you. He predetermined to adopt you, and he predetermined to give you the inheritance. Now, he hasn't told us all the particulars about how those decisions were made. He just told us he made them. And the only thing you need to know is, am I in the thing or not? And the way you know is how you respond to the, to the gospel, the gospel of your salvation. I tell you, <laughs> it's, it's uh, wonderful to see. <coughs> see, Jesus is the heart, remember, in whom? After you believed... After you believed this message, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, here he comes over that again, in whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now Paul brings home to the conscience of the people what has happened to them. 
The work of God within an individual is so transcendent, it's so far above the human intellect that it has to be spelled out by God what actually has happened. Because it's, does it, does I, it's not something the eye can see. Right. It's not something the flesh can feel or touch. It has to be told what's been done. Once it's told, you can, rec you can put it together. You can recognize what's actually been happening. The work of God is always tied to the person of Jesus Christ. It always is. Anytime God said to do something in, this, in salvation that we're talking about, salvation in Christ Jesus, it's always tied to Jesus Christ. <laughs> the epistle of Ephesians contained the words in Christ ten times. In Christ. The expression in him and in whom occur eight times. In Jesus occurs in Ephesians 4.21. By Jesus is found two times. By Christ Jesus is found once. The Lord Jesus Christ is mentioned seven times, preceded by from and preceded by in the name of, and preceded by them that love, and preceded by the God and Father of. Jesus is referred to as a Savior of the body. He's the one who loved the church and gave himself for it. He's depicted as sanctifying and cleansing the church, and the one who will present the church to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. Now, and you read all these things, so you, there's no need to ask, like, who's the book about? <laughs> <laughs> it's very plain who it's about, isn't it? Yes, amen. About what God has done through Christ. And you keep over and over. He hammers this all the way through the book. He keeps hammering this over and over. This is the one in whom believers are found. Paul said, I want to be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, but the righteousness that is from God through him. The expression in Christ is found... 78 times from Romans through 1 Peter. So I say it's a, it's a critical term and concept. In him is mentioned 50 times. There can be no question about where the blessing of God is obtained and retained. Obtained and retained in Christ. The person that is abiding in Christ has obtained what God gives and is retaining it. The person who ceases to abide in Christ loses it all. It's the way it is. It's all in Christ. If you're at a distance from Christ, you're at a distance from salvation. If you have no interest in Christ, you have no interest in salvation. This is the one that is all important. After that ye believe, see there you go back, this is a more precise than trust. Believe like zeroes in on it even closer. Trust is like a general term. Believing is more specific. So far as spiritual life is concerned, it is precisely identified as after you believed. So until a person believed, that nothing of eternal significance has happened. You say, what about being convicted? Well, you don't go to heaven because you're convicted. You have to do something about being convicted. Yeah. See? The good news is to the convicted ones, there's something there. After that you believed. That's right. <laughs> we don't know whether he believed or not. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, eventually believed or not, yeah. Yeah. Initially, this life was prenatal or pre birth. But eventually, the life had to be birthed by water as we were baptized into Christ. Your baptism isn't when life began. It's when life was birthed. Amen. Yeah. Now that distinction is, 
It's not made. I think some people argue as though the life begins. Mm -hmm. It's birthed, yes. just like a natural birth. Yes. That baby's alive for nine months before it's born. Right. It has some movement and there's some recognition. I mean, it has some discernible human parts that you can detect. If you can get a picture inside, you say, yeah, that's a baby. You can see it. But it has to be birthed. There comes a time. In other words, God protects this life mm -hmm. until the time it's, it can go out into the world and survive. Yes. See, trying to get people born ahead of time is a big mistake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> big mistake. The, the birth has to be, is the culmination. Mm -hmm. it, it brings a person into life. Now, after that you believed... <coughs> You were sealed. You were sealed in him with a seal. The NIV reads, you were marked with a seal. The New Revised Standard Version reads, you were given a sign, basic Bible English. You were signed, the Douay Version. You were stamped with a seal, New Jerusalem Bible. He identified you as his own, the Net Bible. And he marked you as belonging to Christ, Living Bible. Now, this was a spiritual seal. The Jews were circumcised. That was an external seal. It said, this is, this is a Jew. This is an internal seal. It's a seal like a notary seal. It's a seal like the governor's seal. You get an official document that has a government seal on it. Even your money has a has a seal on it. That is seal says, this belongs to me. This is the one who owns this. This is the one who originated and issued this. When you are sealed, you are stamped as belonging to God. You are mine. You are the most important person to know that is you. You can't prove this to anybody else unless there's someone with a spiritual mind who can detect these things. And even then they had to be cautious. You were sealed. He, Paul wants the people to, you were sealed. A mark was put on you. Remember in the book of Ezekiel, God determined to punish Jerusalem and destroy the city. <coughs> some angels, he sent some angels out to destroy it. But there was, so, there was a personality standing among them and had an ink horn on his side. Now as I was in school, grade school, every desk had an ink well on it. And you used a, an ink, it wasn't a quill, it was a pen that you dipped. Even when I was first an accountant, an accountant, we all had ink wells and pens. Permanent entries were in ink. Temporary entries were in pencil. This is a standard. Still do this. This counting still do this. Temporaries in pencil, permanence in ink. This this seal is in in ink. <laughs> it's it stamps you as belonging to God. This is mine. You are sealed. Anyway, this before these angels set out, this man of the ink horn, God told him. Go through the city and find everybody that sighs and cries uh -huh. because of the abominations in Jerusalem. Put a mark on them. Yeah. The rest of you angels, when you go through the city, don't do anything to those with the mark. Uh -huh. In the book of the Revelation, the seventh chapter, the conversion of Israel is in a pictorial form. And their picture is 144,000, which are all the, the whole house of Israel. They're identified the whole house of Israel. All the 12 tribes. And they were sealed. He said, don't do anything. There was a judgment going out. He said, don't do anything till we seal these 144,000. They put a mark on them, which meant they, they were exempted from the destruction. <laughs> all right, now this, this is kind of what this is all about here. God has determined he's going to destroy the heavens and the earth. They're all going to pass away. He's going to destroy the ungodly. It's going to happen. That's right. But before he does this, he's mar 
he's marking who's his who are exempt from the destruction. They'll survive like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego survived the furnace, uh -huh. and Daniel survived the lion's den. They'll, and Joshua and Caleb survived the desert. See, they'll, they'll survive it, but the mark, the mark, you've been sealed. After that you believed, you were sealed. What with? You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. <clears throat> now, there are people that debate, like, how do you know you have the Holy Spirit, and when do you get the Holy Spirit, and so forth. And it's just too academic. It's just too academic of an approach. If we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit is what marks you as belonging to Christ, I want to know whether I have the Holy Spirit or not. I don't want any guesswork on something like that. Because if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. That's what the Scripture says. Romans 8, 14. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. What does that mean? That's the, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit that God had promised. The promised Holy Spirit. Now God had promised several places in Scripture that he was going to give his Holy Spirit to man. God would pour out his Spirit on all flesh, that is, without discrimination. He would pour out his Spirit upon all flesh, that's Joel 2.28. Isaiah said that he would pour out his Spirit and the men would become a fruitful field. Isaiah 30. 16, 15. As a result of having the Spirit poured out upon them, the people would spring up and say, I am the Lord's. That's Isaiah 44, 3 through 5. Now, this is a Spirit that is stamps, seals the people yeah. of God. As a result, the Spirit was poured out, and there were, Jesus said, there would be living waters flow out of the belly yeah. of whoever believed on him. Then John adds this editorial remark, this spake he of the Holy Spirit, which would be given to those that believe at when Jesus was glorified, for as yet he had not been glorified. So as soon as Jesus finished the work on earth, went back to heaven, sat down, was enthroned, then the Holy Spirit was sealed and living water begin to, life begin to flow out from mm -hmm. these people. Mm -hmm. Living waters. Uh, things that edify. Yeah, right. Things that comfort. Things that build up begin to come out of. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they were sealed. They were sealed. The sending would involve, the sending of the Spirit would involve the creation of a new heart. Mm -hmm. And it would involve the taking away of the stony heart. Ezekiel 36, 26. God would cause, by this outpouring, God would cause the people to walk in his statutes and keep his judgments and do them. That's Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. That's what would result now when they were marked. Well, what about a people, what about a professed Christian people that are not keeping his judgments and not walking in them. Do they have the seal? I'm not asking for an answer, but I'm saying it's time somebody started thinking about this. It'll alter how you react to the modern church. That churches are filled with people that are not walking in God's judgments. And if this is true, that Ezekiel prophesied, that means they don't have the seal. Yeah. Really given the primarily, your first um, judgment has to be on your own self. That's right. You have to be honest and say, is this happening? If it's not, well then, go to the one that gives it. That's exactly Amen. right. Amen. You've got to have the seal. And if you don't have the seal, you haven't believed. Uh -huh. Well, what else can you conclude? After this, you believed you were sealed. 
with the spirit that God promised. All right, I read to you what God promised it would happen when this spirit was poured out from on high. What would happen? Now, if that hasn't been happening, it means they haven't been, spirit hasn't been poured out. And if they hadn't been poured out, it means the person hasn't believed. What's the answer? Preach the gospel to the people, bring them to believe. That's the answer to the problem, to the situation. I don't know if everybody in Ephesus believed or not, but after hearing this, what he's saying, <laughs> there'd be pressure put on him to believe. It is what God has promised concerning the Spirit that enables those who have received him to identify their true state. He tells you what the Spirit will do. The Spirit groans within you. Romans 8 says, groans within you. Holy Spirit produces fruit. Galatians 5.22. So it tells you what the Holy Spirit moves a person to do. And when those signs are in you, then you know you've, you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Which is, he does this, the, the, the sentence continues. <laughs> The Holy Spirit is the earnest of your inheritance. Earnest means down payment, mm -hmm. pledge, <coughs> guarantee. The first part of the inheritance. The Holy Spirit, your inheritance, I remember your inheritance is in heaven, reserved in heaven for you, 1 Peter 1.5. The inheritance is in heaven, the Holy Spirit's from heaven. He sent down from heaven the Holy Spirit, did you say? Yeah. All right, when he sent that, that, and you possess the Holy Spirit, that's your first sampling of the inheritance. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> that's like the grapes of Eshcol yeah. were, to, were to Israel, which is the, boy, if that's the introduction, you could imagine what's coming. Yeah. Praise yeah. God. You can just imagine what's on the way. Mm -hmm. You read all the things the Holy Spirit does. <laughs> what walking in the Spirit is. If you walk in the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's first, it's Galatians 5.16. You won't do it. Yeah. Well, if the Holy Spirit has that much to give you now, well, it's, it's just a pledge. It's an yeah. introduction. Yeah. Earnest money. That's what God's given you to guarantee you're going to get the rest. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't have the guarantee of the rest. Mm -hmm. But if you have the Spirit, you, that the Spirit himself is the guarantee yeah. that you'll have the rest. Mm -hmm. Now, does it make sense when the Apostle says, Quench not the Spirit whereby you're sealed? Yeah. Does that make sense not to, not to grieve not the Holy Spirit? See, does it make sense not to do it? Of course it makes sense. Resist the, re, don't resist the Holy Spirit like those Jews did. Don't do that. Brother Gavin, this also shows what a great mercy of the Lord it is to show us that we have the Spirit. Amen. Amen. These things, making manifest the things that he does so we can identify him in us. Yes. Because there are some uh, abuses of how you get the Spirit and the evidence of having the Spirit, some people respond by saying, well, everybody gets the Holy Spirit when they're baptized. Well, what about those Ephesian disciples that were baptized and didn't get the Holy Spirit? They say, well, that was a different baptism. That's the point. <laughs> That's the whole point. Those people were honest. They said, we haven't heard if there is such a thing as the Holy Spirit. He said, well, what kind of baptism were you baptized with? said, John's baptism. I know a lot of people have been baptized with John's baptism, too. They didn't call it John's baptism. He said, well, John, you, John, John's baptism was unto repentance. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was so you could repent mm -hmm. thoroughly. And, it, and then you were to believe on him that would come after. Mm -hmm. Now, that person that should come after, he's come. So now, now you, you have to believe on Christ. Uh -huh. And be baptized into Christ, not unto repentance. Amen. They were they were baptized then. The earnest of the Spirit. It's the earnest of what? It's the earnest of our inheritance. And the scriptures do speak about the inheritance. It's an eternal inheritance. Or uh, 
Jesus said the meek will inherit the earth. Revelation 22, 7 says, He that overcometh will inherit all things. That's, we're, ta we're talking about a big inheritance here, beloved brethren. Jesus said they would inherit eternal life. Matthew 19, 29. There's also the kingdom of God that's inherited. That's pretty, pretty big. What's the pledge that this is going to happen to you? The Holy Spirit is the first fruits of that inheritance. First fruit of that inheritance. Is what you've got until. Until. You're not always going to just have the first fruit. Salvation, in a sense, gives you heaven to go to heaven in. Amen. See? Gives you a heavenly environment. Mm -hmm. Heavenly gifts, heavenly perspectives, heavenly fellowship. In order to make it. Amen. But you're only coming, that's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's until <coughs> the redemption of the purchased possession. <coughs> now here the multitude of virgins followed up again. Here's what some of them say. Well, this one's pretty good. Redemption of God's own possession. Redemption of those who are God's possession. The redemption of God's own people. Till God gets back that which is his. The redemption of that liberty. Until we're set free to belong to him. In anticipation of his full redemption and our acquiring completed possession of it. Well, some of those are pretty good. But some of them say that the possession is the people. Now, there, there is a sense in which the people are God's inheritance. But that's God's inheritance, not our inheritance. The Holy Spirit is a pledge of our inheritance, not the pledge of God's inheritance. The purchased possession is our bodies. And it's, it's spilled out in, in Scripture. Romans 8.23 says that we ourselves groan, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. That's the one part of you that's not saved. That's the one part of you that's not changed yet. That's the one part of you that's got to go. That's the one part of you that can't get into heaven, your body. And while you're in the body, now what a thing this is. God uses your body as a temple of the Holy Spirit. Just to show you how powerful God is. Amen. Don't you know your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit? Which you have from God. And you're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. So does where you go make a difference? So I think so. Does what you do make a difference? Yes it does. Does what you wear make a difference? Yes, it does. Uh -huh. Holy Spirit's living in your body. Uh -huh. What a thought. <laughs> Isn't that like God to do something like that? Yeah. Which ye have, you have the, in, which is the earnest of your inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. And when the trumpet sounds and the voice of the archangel, the dead in Christ rise, and this mortal puts on immortality. No more first fruits. That's going to spell the end of the partial and the bringing into the complete inheritance. You have this until the redemption of the purchased possession. So, why did Paul say, to be, it's better, I prefer to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Why did he say that? In view, it's in view of this, <laughs> in view of this that you're talking about here. He knows that the Holy Spirit is a pledge of the inheritance which is in heaven. We have an in heaven, in heaven, an inheritance that's reserved for us. And we are in the meantime kept by the power of God, which is this earnest in the body, unto salvation. We're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. See, it's important that the Ephesians know this. If they're going to, he's going to give them some pretty 
large assignments. He's going to tell him, put off the old man. He's going to say to him, put on the new man. He's going to say to them, you that stole, stop stealing. He's going to say to them, put on the whole armor of God. See? He's going to give us the big assignments. That's why he's giving this big, big body of information, this reality, this redemption. It's in Christ Jesus until the day, until the redemption of the purchased position. So when you look at your body, it's temporal, causes you a lot of trouble. I understand that, but it doesn't even belong to you. I mean, you've not got a right to cremate this body. It doesn't belong to you. Bury it. God's going to raise it. Bury it. Like Jesus was buried. He wasn't cremated. The Philistines, they cremated the dead. I don't want to be a Philistine. And all of this is going to be, we've received the Holy Spirit as a down payment of the inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Unto the praise of his glory. All right, that is when the re redemption of the purchase position of the body takes place, then we will be, as Isaiah put it, a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. <laughs> That's what the praise of his glory. Here it will be. God will be seen in his total work right here. That's where we're headed. He told them the means. It all, the whole process started back here when you trusted. Yes. Mm -hmm. When you believed, then you were sealed mm -hmm. to help you make the trip all the way to the end. See? And you were sealed, and you kind of know what you're going to get because you got a sample of it now. When you have this joy of the Holy Spirit, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, say, hey, that's a sample of what we're going to have. Mm -hmm. We're not going to have trouble and sorrow that's right. and tears and opposition and fightings within and fears without. We're not going to have that. We just look at the, let's look at the first fruits we got here. Let's check out the seal, see what we have, and it's a pledge of what is to come. My brother and I have expended my energy. <coughs> and if you have anything you'd like to add tonight? You can see the Holy Spirit as a, as a sphere <laughs> in Christ Jesus. That As long as we, we remain in that sphere, That's we right. can, we can right. uh, enjoy the benefits That's of the right. sphere. Uh -huh. The joy and the peace. And, uh, Amen. You know, it's the only, when we get outside of that Walk in the Spirit. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. We can sit in the heavenly places. Amen. That's uh, because we've been sealed. Amen. Amen. See, sitting in heavenly places, walking in the Spirit, living by faith, being in Christ Jesus, it's all different perspectives of the same thing. That's right. Amen. Yes, Brother Rick. Mercy of God that uh, all of us face competition every day. The Spirit lusts against the flesh, and the flesh lusts yeah. against the Spirit. But God's been so merciful and giving us the first fruits of the Spirit. And you, this is like something of which there is no law against you. God yeah. won't say, well, that's too, okay, too much Spirit now. <laughs> you know, time to get out of the four walls and go into the world, as they say. But God doesn't do that, so you can taste as much as you want. Mm -hmm. See, the Lord is good, and it gives you the incentive to fight against the flesh and to work out your own salvation yeah, right. to the end. Amen. See, we're not seeking balance. <laughs> the the uh, first fruits of the Spirit recognizes the unity of the Godhead uh, and the fact that Jesus has actually done something. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you can't you can't have Jesus and not have God in the Spirit because of the unity that exists Amen. between them. Amen. There there's an automatic uh, unity within the, the Godhead that, that we participate in. But if Jesus had not really done something, 
then there would be no unity of the Spirit. It says, he that hath not the Spirit is none of his. That's right. Amen. It's, it's because it's real that we have. Now, we're, there's a limitation to our participation here because of the hindrance of this body and our present condition. But that doesn't override the reality of what Jesus has achieved and what we have become. And if it's real, then it's going to have evidences. You can't have evidence without the reality behind it. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, see, we're saved by hope. Mm -hmm. So in this, and all, all your troubles stem from the fact that you're in the body. That's right. But, but this body is going to be redeemed. That's right. There's the hope. See, there's the hope factor, and when you live in hope of the redemption, and I'm not, I'm not going to, I don't, I'm not looking forward to being without a body, mm -hmm. not for that we would be unclothed. See, I don't want to be without a body, but the anticipation of having a redeemed body that will be in accord with my spirit, while well, it is, as they say in the world, exciting, isn't it, to think about it. Now you've got the two in conflict. There to be in perfect harmony. Amen. Your spirit will say, I think I will go to the throne and praise God today. And the body will say, Amen. Right. <laughs> or the body will say, I want to walk over here and do this or that for the glory of God. And the spirit will say, I'm with you. All right, I'm right with you there. Amen. <laughs> Anyone else tonight? All right. Heavenly Father, how we thank Thee for the nature of salvation, the thoroughness of it, the completeness of it, and that you have told us what really has happened. We thank and praise you for this, Father. It's, it's truly good news and glad tidings. We thank you. You've promised to redeem this body. We confess we're dis discontent with it now, and yet we're thankful that it is a temple of the Holy Spirit and that there is something that a mitigating factor that can help us in this present time. We commit ourselves to you in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.